get started here. Thanks for coming. It's a joy to be here. Um, hello. Come, come in. Hello. <laughs> oh, it's the troublemakers again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. So what we'll do, we'll start with prayer, and then uh, we'll get into this little presentation, which is mostly made of pictures and stories. So let's let's go ahead and pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the beauty of this day, for the ability to come together and experience fellowship, community, and to grow deeper in our faith, and especially today to grow deeper in our appreciation for the office that you gave to Peter and his successor and the importance of the city of Rome in our lives as Catholics, what it represents in witness to the gospel truth that you saved us from sin and death and promised to raise us to life. We ask all of this through Jesus, as we, sorry, in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so Father Dave asked me to give this presentation, and at first I didn't know exactly what I would talk about. I wanted me to talk about seminary and life in Rome, um, which just, just from that name alone isn't really that interesting, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk about just life in Rome in general, but my perspective as a seminarian there, which hopefully, since this parish is actually unique in that it's ac actually gotten all of the guys who have gone to Rome, uh, for at least a summer. <laughs> I figured it's due time to explain to you why we're over there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll offer a little bit of perspective there, um, and just kind of help explain what we do over there, why it's important, why Rome is important, um, if you ever get a chance to visit. Really, I'm going to focus on um, sort of four topics. The first is the why we send seminarians there. And then I also would like to just kind of focus in on why Rome is important for us as Roman Catholics. Um, and then a little bit about what life is like over there for me as a seminarian and then in general. And then at the end, I'll just offer some uh, Really, it's just eight suggestions, if you ever get a chance to go over there, of sites that are historically important and rather beautiful. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this photo is from Bishop Rhodes' Ad Lumina visit from uh, December 20, whatever, uh, 2019. So every five years, mm -hmm, yeah, so every five years, every bishop of the world has to make a trip to Rome in what's called the Ad Lumina Apostolorum visit, which is the to the threshold of the apostles, is what that means. So every bishop has to go visit St. Paul's remains, and St. Paul outside the walls, and St. Peter's remains, and St. Peter's Basilica, and then has to meet with the Pope. Um, and then all the Roman sort of dicasteries is what they're called. These are sort of like managerial offices for different aspects of the life of the church. So there's, there's the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, there's the congregation for clergy, the congregation for bishops, and they have to go meet all these. So um, this photo shows you uh, St. Paul's Basilica outside the walls of Rome. Right here is where St. Paul's actually buried on the Via Ostia, so, that, so the way to the port city of Rome, which is Ostia. So those would be the topics. That's a little introduction, what's cool about Rome. We'll start here. Why do we send seminarians to Rome? Three main reasons. One is to have proximity to the Holy Father. So every um, country has a college in Rome. So there's the Spanish college, there's the English college. Um, some of them are conglomerates. So there's a Mexican college of just different areas of the world or specific countries that have seminarians over there to study at the Roman universities and to be around the Pope essentially, which is kind of, the real motivation for that is because what we found is that as the church expanded and people sort of weren't connected to the Holy Father and to Rome uh, as the concept in communion with the church, people started to kind of get their own ideas about what the faith was, which wasn't really that helpful, or to just kind of have weird conceptions of power structures within the church. So. The North American College, which is the American Seminary in Rome, was founded only in the 1850s, um, since we're a relatively recent nation. But some of these colleges actually go back to the 1300s, the 1200s. Um, of seminaries have constantly been there. There's also plenty of religious houses, so most of the religious orders in the church 
have their headquarters in the city of Rome somewhere. Um, or they'll send over different people to study. So for example, the Dominican sisters in Ann Arbor, Michigan, they have a little house that's connected to the, the American seminary uh, where they send some sisters. There's the RSMs from Michigan. They send sisters to study there too. So it's just this big conglomerate of people kind of getting close to the Holy Father and then also encountering each other in the universality of the church, which is the second reason to encounter the church in a different context with different problems, with different uh, sort of strengths and weaknesses, really helps sort of shape a more global vision of what the church's mission is um, and what we're about in proclaiming the gospel of Christ. So sometimes when we kind of focus on just our own nation or problems in the context of how we preach the gospel or what we think is important, we can get pretty narrow um, and fixated on things. So one of the benefits of going to the same place and then meeting each other is when I talk to a French seminarian about what the church is like in France, I get a lot of insight into like, oh, some of these issues or problems are common and we have different ideas about those things or different experiences. And then some of them, like we, you know, they, they'll say something and I'll just be like, I have no, I have no concept for what that, what that's like. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> and then the, the other thing for us, especially as Americans, I think, uh, a benefit there is to actually immerse oneself into the culture of Europe um, and to see what a culture that's shaped by Catholicism actually looks like, even though in a lot of ways Catholicism, is, like the church in general, has kind of started to, to come out of the center of the culture, even though it's still around. So, like I say, one is proximity to the Holy Father. Here's a fun photo. This was during the Advent. Um, we got to meet uh, Pope Francis which was a great joy. I was supposed to meet him again because I was supposed to serve Easter Mass for him in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> but yeah. When was this? This was in December of 2019. Yeah. Before, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right before. It was really funny because, so the American bishops are divided into 14 groups. So they were coming every week for 14 weeks. They finished the last week of February and then two weeks into March, we were sent home. <laughs> so it was kind of crazy uh, how it worked out. But so this aspect of proximity to the Holy Father and sending seminarians there, um, just getting to be around, to be at the Angelus, to, to meet the Pope, to be at like, different papal masses and things, uh, I consider a great gift uh, and a great joy. But it also helps shape the vision of you know, how I conceive of the church and, and how I really view the, the office of St. Peter. So, in the scriptures, uh, Peter is given a specific role to strengthen the faith of others, but also to actually carry the faith that Peter professes uh, in the moment where he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then Jesus responds, you're the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Um, he's really talking about a person, and it's really important to conceive that this sort of, what we call the office of Peter, is really this defense of that very basic faith and the truth about the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what's sort of passed on from each pope to each pope. So it's important that Jorge Bergoglio actually carries the office of Peter. And while those are two distinct sort of concepts or ideas, they're mixed together in this one person whose job, whose sole reason for existence is to strengthen the faith of all the other Christians, um, and to kind of be that safeguard of like, no, this is, we know who Jesus is because he told us uh, that connection, if you were at Mass this morning, I preached on, uh, I know a guy who know, like, I know someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew Jesus Christ in the flesh. Um, that passing on of that knowledge of who Jesus is, is really important, and, and the Pope represents that in a very concrete and personal way. Um, and so to be close to that is in sort of a, it's an unexplainable gift, but it really helps grow in that vision of, of what we, it means to profess faith and what a gift it is that it's been passed on to us. But did you get chosen? How did you get chosen? Oh did yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The next time you're like, close to the Pope, can you say, Father David, you can't hear something? I'll try to do it. <laughs> Just a little. Oh, I just said very real. And then he, he actually just talked. He, there were, so this was during the meeting of the bishops of Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. All, all were together. So we were all there. There was probably about 15 of the seminarians there. Um, so after he 
we, we met him, exchanged some niceties, and then um, we kind of grouped up, and then he started joking around with us a little, uh, gave us a little uh, sort of mini speech. Yeah, and then, and, then he, and then he was like, okay, well now pray for your bishops because I have to talk to you. And then he actually has a, he has a limp, so he kind of limped <laughs> over and away, and then we left. That's, he was speaking Italian. Italian, and all of you probably know that. We have, yeah, most of them have to. Some guys go to a university that's in English, uh, but uh, the majority of us study in Italian. So, yeah. Um, okay, so then, yeah, this aspect of universality. This is from the Dome of St. Peter's. Uh, and the reason I'm putting this picture up with the concept of universality, uh, the, the colonnades of St. Peter's were built as an afterthought to the basilica, but they were built in a specific way, and that's to look like the arms of the church gathering the nations in. And so, uh, though, well, this is this is when there are still long lines at St. Peter's. This is the beginning of the line, and then this is the end of the line to get in. So it would take like two hours if you were waiting that long. Um, but within this sort of group would be people from all nations, nationalities, cultures, uh, even religions, people would come to St. Peter's for, you know, to just appreciate the art. So within that, it's actually a really concrete symbol of what the church's mission is, which is to draw all people to Jesus Christ. And so it's these arms gathering it in. And that's really, to me, what Rome represents in a lot of ways, because it, 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 it tends to be this place where people just come, obviously for its, its long history and importance, just in secular world history, but then also its great importance in the life of the church um, as the, the seat of, of Peter and then also the witness to the lives of the saints. And then lastly, there's this aspect of the culture of Europe. This is the um, Corpus Christi Monstrance in the Toledo Cathedral in Spain, and that's me standing next to it. Uh, part, of the, part of being over in Rome um, for seminarians is getting that culture. So once you're sort of over there, it's actually relatively inexpensive to travel around. And that was kind of the mandate given to go see things like the Toledo Cathedral, which was built by a church that has been in Toledo, Spain since the 150s. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of immersing oneself in the way in which different people, uh, different nations and peoples uh, will express the faith and live the faith and how that affects their lives is really interesting, especially, I think, as an American. Generally, we're not, like, as openly expressive of faith, I find. Um, it's funny, because we're more willing to talk about it. We'll talk about issues of faith, whereas Europeans don't really talk about it, but they're really expressive. So a lot of their culture or the aspects of the way they live, like, for Italians, I always reference the way that they eat. It's very communal. There's no like rush. You would sit down at an Italian lunch and it could take two and a half hours depending on what's going on. Like it's very involved about the person. Sorry. Um, who the person is like encountering that person. Um, whereas we kind of generally view food as more of a utility. Uh, sometimes we don't. But that's sort of an aspect of culture that comes up in how we view the faith, how we live the faith, and so immersing oneself in that can be. It's a good, it's a good thing. All right. So before we move on to this topic, I'll just talk about the question of how that, how one goes to Rome. Uh, it depends. What's going on here, Sam? Yes. Oh, here we go. It's overriding my mute. Someone wants to get in touch with me. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. The the answer to the question of how one gets to Rome uh, is. Vary. It depends on the bishop, actually. So some bishops will tell guys that they're going over to Rome. They'll just say, like, hey, you're going to go study over there. Um, others will wait until someone asks to go over there. And our bishop's in the middle. So our bishop, uh, Bishop Rhodes, will he'll ask the guys if they want to go over, but he leaves it open. So there's some people, uh, some seminaries for the diocese who've been asked and said no. There's uh, others of us who have been asked and said yes. So um, he kind of leaves it. Because it's obviously a big choice. We're over there for five total years. Um, and 
you know, you're only home for about three months during the summer for those years. You spend the first full summer over there, so two years straight you spend in, in Europe. So it's definitely not something that everyone wants to do, even though it's kind of like, I think from the outside perspective, it's really awesome. Obviously, it's a great opportunity, but there are certain things that would cause someone to not be interested in that. Um, so there's no there's no specialness really. People want to say that. I don't. I I say I always say I know the guys there. It's, it's just like the U.S. Yeah. Can you say you were there a couple of years and you're like this isn't for me? Oh yeah, yeah. At any point. In the whole seminary process in general, up until ordination, it's like the last day that I could leave was May 21st at midnight, or I guess actually May 22nd till 10 a.m. Uh, <laughs> so there's, yeah, generally though, I would say uh, the people that get sent to Rome have a little bit more certainty around that because it is a little bit more of an investment in the person. Uh, you don't just send, if someone's sort of telling you, oh, I'm a little bit on the fence about priesthood, um, I don't think you would send that person overseas because that's not necessarily the solution to them figuring out if priesthood is right for them. Well, I mean, even if you're going to stay in a priesthood, could you still come back? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you can. Always, there's some guys who would transfer back yeah. um, to U.S. centers. So. Yeah, the language, like learning the language, and mm -hmm. you know, any difficulty or you know, what kinds of things do you have mm -hmm. so that you can learn in that way? Yeah, so we had. Um, I'll get to that more too. Uh, we had like a two month crash course in Italian. Was, I flew over doing very, knowing very little and learned it in two months and, and then here we are. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I'm not really that gifted with languages. I know that, yeah, it, it sounds impressive. It's still a struggle and you still have to get used to it and things. There's an app for that. Yeah. <laughs> there always is. <laughs> but yeah, so. Um, we do sort of full immersions. The summer I was over there, so I went in 2018, and then the summer of 2019 I spent three weeks in, in a further language school, and then a month living with eight Salesian priests in northern Italy with full immersion. So there was actually there was one person who would speak to me in English. Um, or maybe there was two, sorry. It was the housekeeper and her father, because he was from Ligonier. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 He had funny. served in the military and met uh, his Italian wife, and they lived in this little city. Uh, and his daughter happened to be uh, the housekeeper for the eight priests in the house. So it was really fun. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> the next theme um, that's a little bit about just some of why. This is. I just want to focus on, take the opportunity to point out like, the importance of Rome. We're called Roman Catholics uh, for a reason. <laughs> and uh, I think that sometimes it's hard to conceive of exactly like, what is the big deal about the city of Rome. Uh, and so I just have three sort of parts to that answer. Rome is the city, city of Peter and Paul. Um, they're, they died there. They were buried there. Um, their entire proclamation of the gospel culminated in them being in the same city and killed um, by Nero in the same persecution, of, uh, which was the first sort of open persecution of Christians. Uh, and there's a witness there of, of that faith. The second is the witness of the faith of the saints uh, and the lived experience of the church in the context of the city of Rome. And the last is that it's the see or seat, the diocese of the Holy Father. Um, so. This is a, I, I took this picture on, actually I got, I took this picture on my way back for, uh, from uh, taking my COVID test to fly home in May. Uh, it was kind of a cool one, with the little, the little cars, uh, classic Italian cars, that are just so tiny you think that you might die if you get in one. Um, <laughs> but, such is life. Um, so this is the, this is a view of St. Peter's Basilica, um, where he's buried, obviously. So, Peter and Paul both come from the Holy Land, Paul from Tarsus, Peter from, uh, from Galilee. They have totally radically different stories. You know, Peter is a fisherman, very uneducated, kind of a gruff guy. Uh, Paul is a super educated Pharisee. Um, and they both encounter Christ in really radical ways that change their life completely. 
theater has a more gradual sort of encounter um, where he comes to realize what's going on. Paul encounters, encounters Jesus on the, on the way to Damascus and is thrown off his horse, uh, thrown to the ground, struck blind. Uh, and so both these, both these men then really go out in unique ways. Peter is generally known to have evangelized to the Jewish people, and then Paul is known to evangelize to the Gentiles. And so they're put together in the feast days and in the city, they'll be always be depicted together, um, because it really represents, again, the universality of the mission of the church, of the gospel, that it's meant to be, you know, I, there's that one hymn, sometimes you see, like, you know, there's no longer a Gentile or Jew, uh, it's just one in the Lord, that's from Paul. Um, and this, that concept is really embodied in these two men and how they really preach the gospel uh, and, and started to realize exactly what the, what the resurrection meant um, in our life. So Peter is this symbol of faith and then Paul is this symbol of the definitive interpretation of the new law, of what, of what the law of Christ and the law of faith actually means. So you get all these combinations of that, Gentile, Jew, law, faith. Um, coming together in the witness of these two men. And so, Rome itself is marked by their witness of faith as a foundation. Um, <clears throat> I love this tree. So, <laughs> yes, that's a tree. That's a tree. Yeah. Um, so this is, this tree is on the Janiculum Hill. It's actually right next to the seminary. You can see it from the roof. Uh, as you can see, it's in shackles. This, these are all metal metal shackles, and then down here they've they've poured concrete and then put a brick little facade on there. Um, <clears throat> you're wondering why is this tree important? This is the tree that Philip Neary would take kids up on the hill of the Janiculum, and he would teach them under. He'd sit under this tree and he'd teach them. And so to commemorate that, they killed the tree <laughs> by trying to memorialize it. <laughs> and now they're trying to keep it together by putting shackles up to hold the branches. <laughs> and it has a very nice little plaque telling you the story. <laughs> um, and this is, to me, typically Roman in preserving the witness of the faith uh, of saints. So Philip Neri is the second apostle of Rome, is what he's known as. He, is, he comes to Rome um, in the middle of the beginning of the, of the Reformation, in a really dark time for uh, the church, and just in the figures that are involved around the papacy and a bunch of politics and such. Um, and he just goes out into the street in clown outfits and just doing, he would shave half his beard and just go around and yell at people. Uh, like, he's just wildly crazy. Um, but he loves the people, uh, he preaches the gospel, and he actually like kind of keeps the faith alive um, in a way that other people who are responsible for that weren't. Um, and this that just kind of epitomizes to me the, the, the experience of the city itself, is that there's, there's been this long history of persecutions, the church having some uh, pretty insane and intense secular power, which it kind of had no business having, uh, and everywhere in between, you know, people really witnessing well to the gospel, people not witnessing well to the gospel, scandal, uh, growth, health, all these things. It's all been there. Um, and the city kind of encapsulates that. Walking through, you see things like this, um, and you're reminded like, oh wow, actually the faith in it's being passed on. Paul says that we hold the, the truths of the faith in earthen vessels, um, and it's a reminder of that. Like the humanity of the church uh, can be real, uh, it can be harmful, but Christ's promise to be with us actually uh, conquers those things and the weaknesses and failures of, of any individual professing the faith and, and trying to continue that. And so Rome itself to me embodies that experience uh, and, and how each part of each person in, in the way that they encounter Jesus and live in the church actually can affect it and grow it and, and cause its Climb, all these things. So that's sort of, it's all there in Rome in a way that I haven't ever experienced anywhere else. Um, and lastly, this is uh, the seat of the Holy Father. So again, this was the I live in a visit. Um, this is the Cathedral Church of Rome, which is a really, it has a really, really um, confusing title because it's, uh, it was built by Constantine 
after the persecution was over, and uh, well, so the Edict of Milan is in 315 or 316. Now I can't remember. It's in some of the trees, so maybe it's out but uh, around there. And then um, I think it's 315. Uh, Constantine legalizes Christianity. Um, he allows it to not be to exist, but not be persecuted, and to honor. Uh, the Christian God, who he believed won him a battle, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. Um, he wants to build a temple to this God, and so he builds St. John Labyrinth, which at the time is actually uh, the Basilica of Christ, the Savior of the world, and then it's later renamed after St. John the Baptist, and then it's later renamed after St. John the Evangelist. So the full title is the Patriarchal Basilica of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist and Christ the Savior of the world at the Lateran, because the Lateran, the name of Lateran comes from the family who built a palace there. So that's a bunch of historical minutiae. I don't think I got the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that confusing, even if you try to understand. <laughs> so it's it's got 15 different names, and it's named after a thing that's actually the family of who built the palace next to it, and not actually the church. So people call it St. John Lateran. It's all confusing. Regardless of all that, this is the Cathedral of, of Rome. So this chair right here you can see right in the middle, um, that is the chair of the Diocese of Rome. And so this symbolism of the chair is actually mimicked, uh, well, copied or shadowed, I guess is a better one, in the cathedral of each diocese. So in our cathedral in Fort Wayne, uh, there's a very nice chair. Um, and it's connecting the bishop of this diocese to the chair of Peter, which is actually that one. Um, and it represents sort of the authority given to the apostles in governing the church. So the chair as a symbol, it's easily to be picked up in academic uh, sort of circles that you have a chair of biology or a chair of physics. Um, it represents an authoritative teaching position or a governance position. And so we have the chair of Peter uh, and then the chair of the bishop, which is also why every time the bishop would come here, uh, Father Dave moves away from the middle chair and the bishop sits there because, you know, the pastor of a parish participates in the governance office of the bishop who participates in the governance office of the apostles. So it's all connected, um, but that's the sort of central image for the, the life of the church in general uh, and the cathedral church of Rome. Uh, and then, yeah, there's some beautiful mosaics and such. All right. Let me make sure I get something. Yeah. Great. Moving into uh, the third topic, what is actual seminary life like, or life like in Rome for us? So this is the seminary I go to. I, ironically, I have all these good pictures of everything else. I don't take pictures of the place I live. So <laughs> I pulled this off the internet, and it's kind of hard. Uh, <laughs> so this is the American seminary in Rome. Um, this is the it's, this is the chapel, and then there's there's actually 12 residence halls with 30 rooms on each um, wing, so it's shaped like a. This way, what is that? It's this way, and then it turns and then it goes out again. It's like a P, I guess, um, with this level. This is the this is the dining room. It's kind of confusing. So we are placed on the Janiculum Hill, which is not a hill of Rome. Uh, it's the hill outside. So this is the Tiber River. Uh, and if you had a more complete map, it would come down here and then it would turn like that. And over here, uh, this is the Field of Mars, is what it's called. It's a marsh, because um, actually Rome is a swamp. Um, <coughs> and then, starting about here, are the actual seven hills of Rome that you always hear about. I didn't include those on the map, because I just wanted to show this. And here it is. This is the Janiculum Hill which is named after the, the Roman god Janus. And then this is the Vatican Hill, um, which is a separate hill named after some family, and I don't remember why. Uh, and we are, play, like, that's where the seminary actually is. So we can see into the square pretty easily. Um, and we're pretty close to the like, uh, Oh, yeah, it's seven minutes to walk. Um, I always like to because for the Angelus, so the Pope gets out every Sunday and gives a little address and then uh, blesses all the pilgrims. And we can get up on the roof here of this tower. Uh, and if you turn Vatican radio on, you can hear him and you can see him in the distance. It's kind of cool. So we go there. Um, 
There are currently, I think, about 150 U.S. seminarians who live there. Um, yeah, we go, we're there for five years. Some people are there for four years. I'll get to that when I get to the university system. Um, yeah, life is pretty normal for a seminary. We have a pretty routine schedule. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with the seminary life, so I'll just review it very briefly. We have mass and morning prayer together every day, starting at 6.15. Then we have breakfast. Then we have classes all day. We actually, this is the only seminary I've been at where we have a consistent lunch. We always eat at 1.15. Um, and then evening study activities, evening prayer at 6.45, dinner at 7, and then free time after that. Uh, and that's pretty much every single day. Uh, that's all sort of marked by different uh, assignments. So we get apostolic assignments is what it's called. Um, mine for two years was giving tours of St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, and then last year and this, this upcoming year, it's doing campus ministry with Notre Dame's satellite campus in Rome. Um, other guys have will work with the, the missionaries of charity, uh, probably the poor. Some people will do hospital visits. There's a lot of campuses with satellite, uh, or colleges with satellite campuses that will help out with while well, well, people are over there, we'll, uh, take them on tours of the city, show them around, do holy hours and such. I don't think there's any other ones. Over. But yeah, um, I don't know if there's any other questions about this seminary. This is the least interesting part. This doesn't sneak out the box. It's just something you do. No, yeah. So I entered seminary out of high school. I graduated high school in Lynn. So I have eight years of seminary, no matter where I am in the world. Um, well, while yeah. we were in the seminary, while we were there, COVID came in mm -hmm. at the beginning of January or so like that. Yeah. And on the news, it may have suffered tremendously yeah. in regards to COVID. How did that affect you in the dorm itself and also you had to come back, but there was right. a period of time, right? When did yeah. you come back? I came back March 11th of oh, 2020. Okay. So yeah, we it was getting really bad in northern Italy. Um, and then the Italian government announced the nationwide lockdown on the 9th of March, I think it was. Um, it was a Monday, because I remember it, they announced it at 10 p.m. I, I had no idea why it was. <laughs> <laughs> you announce these things in the, in the evening. Um, so they announced that, and then we were all given the uh, option of returning home. Uh, so I did. Yeah. So that was, it was early on. Um, it, it had been getting bad for most of February, but it was confined to the north, where it actually hit Italy the worst. I mean, the, the region uh, of Lombardia, where Milan is, um, and that's where it continues to actually be. But we avoided that at the beginning, and then we went back. I went back in September because um, I had a, I have a student visa for Italy, so I was able to get back into into Italy this year. Um, and so we had various sort of lockdowns. The Italian government did uh, three waves of lockdowns throughout this last academic year, um, and then the seminary itself had to had to lock down a couple times because, uh, or at least once, I forget. We had some people who got COVID, um, so it was kind of an interesting year. Not my favorite year of seminary. <laughs> yeah, so we were doing classes remotely. So we were doing them. Uh, this this tower right here, you can kind of see it has four four levels of classrooms, um, and so we would um, go there. There's a TV and desks. And so we would tune into our classes if we couldn't go to go into into class physically. So majority of I think of the we I think we run on 14 week semesters. And of the two semesters, I was in I was at the university in person. I think a total of five weeks. It, yeah, it was crazy for the entire year. Um, yeah. So that that just pulled me right next to, to the next topic, which is uh, the university system. So this is, I just graduated from here uh, a week ago, uh, the Pontifical Gregorian University. So this is the, the university that's run by the Jesuit order. Um, 
That's, that was me on the first day of school. I was very happy. Uh, <laughs> I still am, but just there, it's particular, I guess. Uh, the joy. So there, for the American seminarians that are there, um, we use three different universities in general. The reason we're there for five years is because we're doing two different degrees. So the first three years is the first degree, and then the second three years, or second two years, second half, two years, is a second degree. So I just finished the first three-year degree here at the Gray, and now I'm moving to a different university um, called San Anselmo, which is run by the Benedictines, to do a, a different degree, which is more of a specialization. What I got from this university was a general theology degree, um, and now I'm going to specialize, which is also part of the reason we go to Rome. Uh, so there's a, a different sort of system of ecclesiastical degrees, is what they would be called. Um, a bachelor's in sacred theology, a license in sacred theology, and then a doctorate in sacred theology. And a few of those licenses, what they're called, they're basically master's degrees, you can only get if you're going to the university in the city. So there's there are probably a total of 20 or so universities that are run by different religious orders, and they each kind of have their specialization. So I'm going to be specializing in sacramental theology, um, which is why I'm going to San Anselmo University run by the Benedictines and specializes in liturgy and sacramental theology. And so they're actually one of the only places in the city and therefore in the world that you can get a degree specifically focusing on sacramental theology. Father Royce Gregerson, who was here several years ago, uh, he went to the Angelicum University, which is run by the Dominican Order, um, and he specialized and got a license in moral theology. Father Spencer St. Louis, uh, who was here two summers ago now, um, he went to the Angelican as well and got a, a license in dogmatic theology. So, yeah, there's sort of all these titles of different areas of theology you want to focus on. But that's sort of the another advantage of going to Rome is that you can specialize in a particular area. So it would not be in that complex that you were showing us? No. So that's just where we live. This university, this one is a 25-minute walk into the city from there. So every morning I would go. Um, I always made the joke that I felt like, uh, what is it? Yeah. Uh, you know the opening scene of Beauty and the Beast when Belle's walking through the city and everyone's opening up all the doors? This is how I felt at 8 o'clock in the morning. Because I'm walking through and the guy who fixes motorcycles was opening up his door and pulling all the motorcycles out. And it was like clockwork every day. Because I would pass by the same time, he would be doing the exact same thing at the same time. And, uh, it was just really fun. So I've always wanted to make a parody video of life there, but, uh, but yeah. So we would walk to school every morning and then walk back. But there's some classes where you live too. Um, just just because of the the COVID situation, oh, yeah. so we were watching classes there. Okay. There are classrooms there because we do different conferences. Um, we call them formation conferences. They're really it's just it's a priest or a religious sister um, or like psychology, ex psychological experts giving different talks. We have, like, we'll, for example, at that seminary we'll have every Thursday night an hour-long conference about something. It could be like how to do confessions, or it could be um, how to counsel people, like how to counsel marriages, situations and stuff. So different people will come in and do those, and that's why that classroom sort of complex exists in general. Yeah. Do you get to pick what you want to specialize in, or does the bishop tell you what you're going to specialize in? It's just like going to Rome. It depends on the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> so some bishops say, you're doing this. Have fun. Other bishops wait until they say, so the seminarian says, like, oh, I, I would like to study this. Um, our bishop, again, is in the middle, uh, and it's a conversation. So I, I would talk to him about it, uh, and basically he said, what are you interested in? I said these three things. I'm most interested in this. He was like, "Great, well, we need that." So, it sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah, some of my friends uh, are doing canon law, and they were told that they are doing that. Uh, so, <laughs> that's how that works. <laughs> yeah. So it's a little it's a little confusing because the the seminary and the university are totally separate entities. Um, so the seminary is a residence with priests in, in there to kind of like watch and live with us. 
uh, and then the university is, is strictly a university. So in my class at the Gregorian, there were about 120 people, and they were we were from 30 different countries. Um, there were seminarians. Most of us were diocesan seminarians. There was a large section of religious uh, brothers and sisters. There was, I think there were maybe five just lay people who are were going to like work in parishes as pastoral associates and wanted to get a degree in theology. Um, so it was a really, it's a diverse class, which is another advantage of being there. Um, yeah, listening to, being in different theology classes and listening to people ask different questions uh, or see different professors and the way they kind of conceive of things, um, yeah, is a sort of an experience that you don't get really anywhere else. I had, I had Argentine professors, I had American professors, I had uh, French professors, German, Polish, uh, yeah, everyone's kind of their, their thing. And then if the Gregorian teaches in Italian, and so all of the lessons are in Italian. Um, yeah, and then uh, the place I'm going to next also is, is taught in Italian. But it's kind of fun because you can always tell when you have an English, a native English speaker speaking to you in Italian because they structure the sentences in the same way you would expect them to be in English, which makes it very easy to listen to. <laughs> when you get the native Italian speakers, uh, they generally, the professors in these universities will generally try to remove like idiomatic expressions or weird vocabulary from their lectures, um, but they don't always. So sometimes they're just saying things that you just have to, you know, I, I pull out my phone and just train, like Google it. Uh, like, what, what is this phrase <laughs> that they keep saying and I have no idea what it is? <laughs> so. Uh, and then lastly, yeah, another sort of aspect of life. So at the seminary itself, um, we get two weeks off for Christmas, two weeks off for Easter, and then one free weekend every month. And um, sort of the very clear rationale that Bishop Rhodes gave me in going over, and he's given Father Bryce and Father Spencer, and then there's actually, there's three other guys who are there, Sam and Zane, St. Anderson and St. Langenbrenner, and then Nicholas Monin is another seminarian who's go. He'll be leaving actually in about a week and a half uh, to start his time there. Um, and our sort of mandate is to go see things as much as we can, to travel around, um, to draw that, take that back. So I, yeah, I just kind of did a, a little potpourri of my experiences in traveling. The, this is Westminster Cathedral in London. I was able to spend um, a Christmas there. Uh, and go to Canterbury Cathedral as well. The picture in the middle there, that's actually, so that's Qumran in the Holy Land, right by the Dead Sea. That's where the Essene community, where John the Baptist was a part of, lived. And then they found in these caves, you can kind of see them. These are, these are the Qumran caves, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the, the earliest manuscripts of the sacred scripture that we have. So they actually confirmed with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the veracity of later manuscripts uh, to kind of demonstrate that exactly what had been said was, like what the scriptures have uh, as far as text is accurate up to as early to the time of Christ as we have. So we have some scrolls, even of the Old Testament, that predate Christ from the from Qumran, because it's so dry and arid, they didn't disintegrate. Um, that's the Parthenon in Athens uh, on the far Right. Um, I was able to do a little tour of Greece following St. Paul's second missionary journey in reverse. So we flew into Athens and then went to Corinth and went to Delphi and then went to Thessalonica. Um, so I, part of that, like, yeah, I always find it funny to talk about these things because um, it kind of just sounds like I'm just over there traveling the world. <laughs> but I, I try to be really intentional because, you know, I, so what we did on that trip is we read all of Paul's letters to the cities that he was in. So when I was in Corinth, I read both the little letters to the Corinthians um, in the site where that was, the ancient city. I stood, on the, I stood on the Areopagus, which you can climb still, and read Paul's address to the Athenians, um, which kind of just, and yeah, even in being in the Holy Land, um, like the conception of, of how these things are working and how the narrative is working uh, when, we, when we read the Gospels 
changes when you see when you're sitting on the Sea of Galilee and you're reading in Capernaum, like, oh, Jesus went from here and then went there, and you can kind of visualize it a little better, which the goal of that is not so that I have all these cool experiences, it's that so when I preach uh, the gospel, I can kind of have a, a little bit of a better ability to communicate what's going on, which I try to do a little, I don't know if, if it's effective, but we'll find out. Uh, of just really explaining, like, okay, so we're, we're here, and th this is where we are in the Holy Land, this is what Jesus is up to, this is why it's important. Um, and being there changes how you see that, how you envision it. Um, this is the Cathedral of Krakow in Poland, from which John Paul II, who is the Archbishop, reigned. Uh, and then this is the, the other one on the right there, is the, that's the altarpiece of the Cathedral of, of Toledo, um, Spain. It's just like this very ornate uh, and ancient church. So, like I say, it provides the opportunity to be immersed culturally uh, in a way that is all really directed in its root and sort of drive to actually being a better preacher uh, and to bring those things home because not everyone will be able to go there um, and it's through the generosity of, of this diocese and the people of this diocese that a few of us are able to. If it doesn't help us preach better, then it's kind of a waste, and that's how I view it uh, and try to live it. So I hope that's effective. And then lastly, we'll just conclude uh, with some key <coughs> key sites. Uh, first would be on the on the church side. If you go to Rome, you should always visit the four major basilicas. This is the facade of St. John's in the Lateran. Um, then this is St. Paul outside the walls. Uh, this is St. Mary Major, which is the oldest church dedicated to Mary um, in Rome. And then this is St. Peter's uh, as well. So that's like the, that's where the Pope uh, has his offices uh, and meeting spaces. This is where he actually lives. Um, and yeah, so and then that's sort of, this is the, the Vatican Museums. So this whole thing is the Vatican, I guess. It's always funny, people see the Basilica and call it the Vatican. It's really the entire event, I think. Um, and then, on the more secular side, if you're into Roman history, um, which is really the history of the West, this is the Capitoline Hill, which is um, one of the actual hills of Rome, and it has a really great museum. Uh, it, it's famous for this statue, which is Marcus Aurelius. That's the second the, uh, second version of it. The, the actual original version is inside the museum there. The middle picture is the Roman Forum, which they've actually done a lot of excavation on, um, and it's it's down really low to where the city is now. The picture on the right is exciting. It's the Largo Argentina, which is where Caesar was killed, and it's right in the middle, typical Roman fashion. It's right in the middle of two really busy streets, and they just happened to find this place and started realizing what it was, um, and just three months ago, they announced that they had some funding to actually build, for the first time ever, they're going to build ramps and, and walkways so that people can actually go down there. Because um, it's never been, it's actually a cat sanctuary right now. Um, for the oh city. <laughs> so, if you come in the future, in about a year, you can actually go down there and see, it's some of the oldest temples um, from the city of Rome um, that date back, I mean, to the Republic era of Rome. Um, and then it's obviously it's where Saint, or, uh, Saint, let's see, Julius Caesar was killed. Um, and then lastly is the Arch of Constantine in the, in the Colosseum. These are all actually really close to each other because again, the city of Rome itself, being seven hills, is really tightly packed. Um, it's grown out a lot, but it, it's really all together. So you can uh, you can travel through Rome in a really brief amount of time. I know people who have been there for three days seen quite a bit because you can walk around and run like that. It's really great. So that's uh that's all my thoughts for today. I, I tend to ramble like a European professor, so I don't know if I've kept your attention. <laughs> I figured the photos would be helpful. For you. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any uh, concluding questions. Yeah. So you just mentioned the Vatican. So where is like your North American college? Is it is it situated within the Vatican or is it well, so no, it's it's outside of it, um, outside of the actual territory. Does this map have? 
Yeah, so see, that um, this wall, these are the Vatican walls, and that marks the, the city-state that's the Vatican, according to the, the treaty with Rome. Um, but, yes, we are the Vatican, because it's technically extraterritorial property. The, the, the seminary that we, so I have a Vatican address and an Italy address. Um, it's just a weird sort of fluke of some history with the Roman government. That is why that is. But uh, yeah, so I, I technically have a Vatican address, even though it's outside of the actual city state. Yeah. You referred to Peter and Paul, and I think we're familiar with Paul's association with Rome. But could you tell us how a Galilean and a non Roman ended up in, and not only Rome, but then became the head of the Roman Catholic Right. Church. Yeah, I mean, so Peter um, was going about, he was actually traveling a lot. So he went to um, Antioch. So he kind of went up around, the Holy, uh, from the Holy Land, went up around um, and visited through, kind of proclaiming the gospel. It was, he ended uh, his time in Rome. So he was found, each of the apostles founded churches as they went along. So this is what Paul's talking about. In fact, this is the majority of the, old, of the New Testament, is Paul writing to the churches he founded. So the church at Corinth, the church at Galatia. Um, Peter was doing the same thing. Uh, all the apostles were. They were going out and establishing churches um, and, as they went. And so Peter uh, traveled through and ended in Rome. And so you could... I don't really have an explanation besides that's where he was. Uh, and then the city of Rome caught on fire. Uh, uh, several of the neighborhoods were burned, and Nero blamed the Christians. And Peter was the head of the church, and so he was taken. Uh, he was made the head of the church by Christ, so that was how the church was already functioning. So Paul, even Paul in his conversion, he, he writes when he's telling us about his conversion um, several times, he references that he went up to Jerusalem to meet with Cephas. Cephas is Peter, it's the same person. Um, and so it was already understood by the apostles that Peter had a, a unique role in, in the life of the church. And so he just continued that where he went. So when he dies in Rome, uh, his successor, Clement, is, is understood by all of, the, all of the church to be Peter's successor and therefore the continuation of the office that unites the church as the one who proclaimed the Messiah. Okay. So um, all of the apostles ex like realized the deference to that authority, and then that authority was passed on through that line. Uh, I don't know if that helps. It just seems strange that a Galilean would be accepted by the Romans, considering the history. Right. Well, so the, the Roman church itself, when we say the Roman church in that time, we're not really talking about Romans proper. We're talking about a lot of Jewish converts to Christianity and then a lot of Hellenized um, people, so like Greek influence. So the, the Christian church in Rome, when Peter and Paul are there, is like a few hundred people. It's not, it's not, um, it's not really that important. Um, it only becomes important through its growth and then eventually it's legalized by Constantine 300 years later. Uh, and then once it's legalized, that's when the visible sort of structures of the church really start to expand and grow. So, yeah, I mean, it would just basically be like if, if, uh, if we were starting a church, you know, or Christ came and established a church here in Decatur, and then a group of us went and started telling other people about it, and then we happened to die in South Bend. Um, that continuation and that sort of establishment of how that would work would be how you get there. Um, yeah, I don't think that the the issue of him being a Galilean wasn't uh, an attack on his authority or anything. It was just that was who he was. That was who he was because Christ said so. Next question is, um, one of your objectives is to absorb the European thought, mm -hmm. but isn't it true that statistics show that Americans actually go to, American Catholics actually go to church more mm -hmm. than 
Italian, French, Spanish. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know the statistics on that, but um, I would I would just point out. Yeah, culturally, Catholicism still reigns in a lot of people's minds and the way they act. So, like, I'll talk to really secular Italians, and they still think in terms of the faith, um, which is a different. Yeah, it's just a different. It's a different vision uh, of how of how life is sort of structured and shaped. So, it's not necessarily about who is in church the most the most visible expression. It's kind of like these cultures of, of Europe and, and other nations too, not just Europe, um, are, are have been shaped by the faith in a long standing way. Uh, and that's worth learning from, even though it's not perfect. I don't I don't make any point that any of the European expressions of the faith are ideal or perfect. I would also say the same thing about American Catholicism or Christianity too. Like no one is, uh, is doing it exactly right. And that's where I think the benefit of learning from each other in that is helpful. Because um, there's pockets of the European churches uh, that are super healthy and thriving um, in the midst of that. Just like there are pockets of the American church that are super healthy and thriving in ways that we can't really, like we can only learn from.